who we put money to buy the, the old apartment here in the East Campus, and then find out that, that we indebted it by the previous operator. And, and we didn't do anything about that. And nobody did anything about that, but we're in criminal charges for that guy. Um, that detox center, that four quarters, has, has seen to me, has done more in, in three to five years than we've seen in 20 years of, of control and, and not control and, and just a hot spot. But we're going to have to come together with that. We're going to have to figure out how to, how to get that treatment in. Um, and not only that detox center, there's a mental health crisis in the, throughout the country. But there's a mental health crisis that I see in New Mexico, in Indian County, whether it's with students, and there's no psychologist to go to, whether it's with uh, veterans, we do not have those services here. And somehow, we should prioritize how we get mental health services in our community. It's so important. And it's not a, a mental health is not a thing that's going to schedule a Mental health is, I need services now. And, and how do I get them? We have none of that here. We have had none of that here. We have a mental health issue. They all in jail. Jail puts them in jail. It takes them to the hospital. They try to take medication. And the circle begins again. So those are just some of the key things that I see. Uh, I mean, with you. Um, I, I, I guess um, I won't be remorse for this thing. Um, to Mr. Meyer here. So a lot of government officials gathered together here today and, and his funeral services are going to be next Saturday. Um, and if we just take a moment to have a question, because he's probably done more in our community and humbly led a lot of people and a lot of children in school and looked up and admired him for what he's done for, for, for our country, for our state, for our city. And we have a moment to have a Good morning, everyone. My name is Patty Lundstrom, and I represent House District 9. I was elected in 2001, and I currently chair the House Appropriations and Finance Committee, as well as the Legislative Finance Committee. So, George is right. I mean, I, I don't know of any other community that has uh, that much, I guess, horsepower in terms of budget process. Um, we are a unique state in that we have a dual budget process. We, uh, as a legislative body, through the Legislative Finance Committee, develop a budget, and then the executive develops the budget. So, you'll have the governor's budget come forth, and that will be announced, I believe, in Janu on January 10th, and then our LFC budget will be announced on January 11th. It's usually the day after the, the governor announces her, her budget. But this year, we're looking at at least a general fund budget of over $9 billion. I can tell you, when I was elected in 2001 as a junior member on HAFC, we were working with $3 billion. So that's how much things have changed over the last 27 years. Um, I'm interested in hearing about your, the status of your existing project. I'm also one of those legislators who doesn't like to see money just sitting there laboring. And, as costs are, costs are escalating, and then y'all are coming back for money um, to make sure that the escalation is covered. I want to know what, what's happening. I'm also interested in having the talk hold a meeting like this for the local chapters. I think there is a need for um, coordination there. When the county comes forth and says we need bridges, those folks need bridges too. And I'd like to see that. I know you'll work together with them. But I'd like to see a meeting with the local chapters before the session starts. For me this year, uh, the priority is going to be the whole issue around the hydrogen economy. That's a big deal to me. Strategic infrastructure, such as I-40, and other infrastructure needs. I think that's, that's super important to me. And I'm also interested in hearing what your opinion is. And you're going to tell me what you want today, but I want your opinion on other things. I want to know what this room and the organizations that you represent, your positions are that come through to us. Um, usually we hear a lot from advocate groups on certain issues. I'll give you an example. This year we anticipate there's going to be a constitutional amendment put forth on uh, abortion as an example. 
And I hear loss from advocate groups, but I don't hear from you. And I always tell people that when I go to these meetings, I'll say, well, you never called me, you never sent me an email, you never sent me a text. I'm one of the easiest people to get a hold of when we're up in San Jose, because I can prove it by the text messages I get from all of you, or your email. But it will be issues like that that come forward that we want to hear. We want to hear your opinion also. If you support these things, if you don't, and, and why. Because what ends up happening is they become wedge issues in the legislature, and we spend a heck of a lot of time debating that stuff. And I want to know where my community is. So, with that being said, I'm interested in knowing what your existing project status, status is. Uh, I want to uh, have a good sense of where you stand on other issues outside of the things that you work on directly. I am interested in hearing uh, also how the chapters fit into the, the broader county issues. And you need to know I care a lot about hydrogen. My office is going to have a round table the hydrogen economy, and that's on January 27th. That follows the Alpha Kinley Day. And I want to share with you a letter that I I only brought five copies of coffee to get this out. Is a letter I sent on November 4th. I asked Mr. Ali Zaidi, he's the National Climate Advisor for President uh, Biden, to come and make a presentation to us at that at that round table. You know, when I got into the hydrogen business, this is something that Patty Lundstrom took up. This was an initiative that came through President Biden's office. The governor uh, agreed with it. I helped the governor on her bill, and I'm going to do it again if she's going to do it, if she's going to help another bill. Because it's all good morning, and uh, thank you. I am Representative uh, Juan Johnson, and I represent House District 5, McKinley and San Juan County. I represent East Gala and uh, 15 chapters, San Juan Asian chapters. As of uh, the new redistricting, I no longer uh, have four chapters. And um, I uh, have advocated uh, every year, this is my fourth term, I'll be getting my fifth term in January. Every year that I've served you, I have advocated and shared resources from the state legislature with the city of Dallas, the city of San Juan County, and our chapters. So I will continue to do that as I represent you. I look forward to hearing your proposal uh, along with my colleagues so that we can continue to build on our community assets and uh, make our communities and our, our state our state a great place to live. Um, I too will be looking at our project, um, trouble ready project, and, and projects that we need to complete. We have many projects that we are funding simultaneously, and we have dollars uh, that are shortfall, and we're, we're holding, we're also sitting on dollars because we're waiting to raise more funds. So I will be looking forward to hearing projects that we can complete and check off. Um, I'll be working with um, the intertribal ceremonial so that we can bring that home, so that we can continue to um, fund that and, and work on that ourselves. Um, I've worked with my constituents about uh, our substance abuse issues, uh, behavioral health. Um, I'm a great supporter uh, for our own career pathways, working with uh, UNM and uh, Crown Point NTU. Um, I'll be listening very closely to the Kennedy County School District for education, uh, and culturally appropriate education. Um, yes, our liquor store um, towards uh, 566, um, and then of course, World Camp. The company needs to address that, and um, I'll be talking with my colleagues. And also, just very glad that we're finishing some roads and bridges for the Kimmy County. Um, I worked on the bridge, and it shouldn't take this long, but it's taken me six years to finally complete and renovate a bridge, um, Old Church Rock Line Road Bridge, and that bridge is utilized by school buses and EMT emergency, two elders passed away 
So those are the types of things that I'll be looking forward to here. And um, I look forward to a meeting like this with the teachers so that we can combine our resources with the nomination and uh, our, our neighbors are doing a couple of little relatives. So with that, that is what I have, and I just want to thank you for hosting this meeting. Thank you. I know all of you have something on your mind that you want to get done. And it's awesome that we're in a time frame and a period where it's possible, let me take this off, it's possible for us to accomplish or go forward with projects this year. I served throughout the uh, many of the years that I served. It was a matter of, don't you please don't take this away from me. Please, please. I need that one project. Don't take that money back. And uh, that's what we went through for a lot of years. Instead of going forward, we were going backwards. Money that my predecessor had put into some project was being taken away because they needed that money somewhere else. We're not in that situation today. And I'm looking at you and I'm hoping that whatever project, whatever idea that you have, Whatever is in your future, together we can get it done. That's all I can say. Because it's it's a matter of togetherness. We in the house are going into a whole new world this year. As all of you know, we have a brand new set of leadership in the house. I was the chair of labor last year. I don't know what I'm going to be next year. Okay, of course, I think that's where we want. Somebody called me, one of my secretaries called me and asked me, uh, are you going to I said, oh, with that. I don't know what I'm going to. <laughs> so, with that in mind, please keep that in mind also. I know where I was last year. I don't know where I will be January 1. My friend here was a caucus chair last year. He's not anymore. So, uh, it's a whole different world. Uh, but we're going to go forward. And like I say, the thing is that I know there's money there. I know there's money on the fourth floor that I've been begging for. And I haven't gotten Mr. Chavez to release it. He has been Mr. Marty Chavez, he's the former mayor of Albuquerque. He's hanging on to, I don't know how many million dollars up there. And they just can't figure out what to do. And we can't figure out how to get him to tell us, yes, I've got projects already in that hopper that I'm trying to get out of there. So with that in mind, uh, please, I know you all have something in your mind. Get your priorities. Get your highest priority out there, and let's see if together we can get it done. Thank you, and thank you for uh, thank you for putting this together. I can get his name, I always call him Mark. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to mention one more thing. I would remiss to mention that I will also be working on our health initiatives. I'll be uh, looking at how our hospitals are engaged. We need a hospital in our community. So, thank you. There's a couple of people here today uh, that I wanted to just have them stand and introduce themselves. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Pham, the Sports and Development Director with the Mexico Tourism Department. Mike Pham, the Sports and Development Director with the Mexico Tourism Department. I appreciate it. And anyone else on my event, I really appreciate them being here. Um, you know, hearing this directly for you all. Um, those messages back, um, a few times today, as you can see. Um, so, uh, appreciate having them here, uh, listening in with us today. So, without further ado, we'll, we'll turn it over to that. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Jason Lewis. I'm the chairman of the I can keep the and work on very, very important for the party to you know, one of the last part of the country, we a lot of jobs, we need to think for an entire year, you know, like Jim Lincoln mentioned, you know, we need to hear this, you know, we need to hear this 
from now to what you were expecting from this happen of this hydrogen so you know, you'll be here from somewhere else, not from you, but a different story, so you really need to step up and uh, see what we need to do, because at the end of the day, we feel a lot of God, you know, we need to work on our highways for that hydrogen up also, so those are just issues that I forgot to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate the time. Appreciate the de- local legislators coming down and making some time for us here. Uh, we got Commissioner Baca with us, um, sitting right next to me, Commissioner Moore. Uh, Commissioner Jackson couldn't make it at this time. Uh, but we want to talk about our um, capital labor projects that we're looking for. There's some bigger ticket items, and I'm going to talk about those first. Um, so we'll jump right into those. Um, some are big catalytic and catalytic projects are our carbon coal road development project that we've been working on. Um, currently we have a 40 acre um, industrial park. We're partnering with the city on that. We're in the process of bringing down all the utilities to the park currently. That is fully funded to bring the utilities down. Um, we are also um, process of we have a the um, Carbon core road ribbon cutting ceremony yesterday. That that went very well. We anticipate talking to their vendor, to the Mexico DOT and their vendor. That road will be open Monday, so that's going to be a big a big thing. Um, and that intertwines with our actual capital outlay request. Is that we want to get some um, funding, some design funding money to plan and design the what we call right now the carbon core road south from there to connect to County Road 1 to make that loop. Right now it's it's a gravel road, but with the new road going in that's open, we'll be open on Monday. We need to get that loop going. So our hope is that we could take the heavy uh, trucks, the 18 wheelers, off of the west side of Gallup and pull them through Carbon Coal. That way and then we can redo County Road 1 all the way to, to Carbon Coal for the regular vehicles go up and down. So that'll relieve some of the pressure all the big vehicles going uh, down Carbon Coal, I mean down County Road 1 into Metmore. So that's one of the biggest things that we want to work on for capital outlay. Um, another big project um, is, as you know, we have uh, 46 bridges that are not passable by school buses and fire trucks and water trucks and ambulance. Uh The last uh, three years working with the COG, DOT, um, Patty's office, George's office, Wanda is we are currently building three new bridges right now. We did the Metmore um, Magnumico Bridge last year. We did that ribbon cutting. Right now we're doing Kit Carson Bridge. We are doing the Old Trip Rock Mine Road Bridge, and we're doing one bridge on the Superman uh, Canyon Corridor. So those are very big projects uh, that we're working on. We're also lucky enough to work with DOT Secretary Michael Sandoval and the current Secretary. Um, Secretary Cerna, and we received 1.5 million to design 10 more bridges. So we're currently working on designing 10 more bridges to get those up and going. So um, again, we would like to ask in Capital LA for 1.2 million to design the next eight bridges. So we're doing four, we're, we're designing 10 more, and if we design eight more, we keep cutting away at this. Our goal is with the design of the 10 and the design of the eight is getting ready for the next federal fiscal. Uh, work with Marty Chavez and his staff in the governor's office that, and DOT. They're going to help us combine uh, one big package for one of those infra grants that are major grants. So those bridges are being designed federally, designed because it's federal money. So the, the intent is to be able to go out of the package and say, we've got 20 bridges that we need construction money for. We're estimating about four, 4.5 per bridge. Uh, so those are some big uh, items. But, I mean, we're chipping away. The last three years, we've been chipping away heavily, and we've got four bridges uh, moving now. One's complete, and three we're doing now. Um, the other one is a big project, but we're putting it down in the capital outlay, is the arm stage, the facility upgrades that our hospital really needs. Uh, the county working with the COG and RMCH, is we did a feasibility study right now, so we got a plan done already that tells us what infrastructure is actually needed out there. Uh, so we want to continue that. Uh, the big 
project is actually doing that whole infrastructure upgrade, which is just over eight eight million. The HVAC, the electrical, the borders, the sewer, everything. That's an old building that really needs to be updated. So the capital outlay, we'd like to continue that with two million to get more design and uh, planning done to make that a reality. I mean, it is uh, just like. Representative Munster said, and Senator Munoz said, we need our hospital and we need to put some money into it. So that's what we'll be doing um, and moving forward. Um, Red Rock Park on other priorities. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from the state on some money they had out there that we applied for. Uh, Commissioner Moore and I talked with the governor. She told us she was going to get us some money and we're still waiting, but that park needs some love. We would really like to put some money out there. Uh, we also need some support for our um, our, our rural water systems. Um, we've been working, the county's been helping, I mean, White says, um, Alex said, there's a bunch of projects that we've been working on, on the PER, getting them ready, getting them uh, a design ready. So this is a way to make sure we continue helping them uh, with Water Trust Board and CDBG. Um, so those are other projects that we're working on is the rural water system that helps everybody around the area. As you know, we partner with the city of Gallup on the Navajo Gallup water project. With that being pushed back another five years, we need to work, find other ways to get water into those pipes to get the water out, out not only to Gallup, but to the whole community. So we're working on those. And the county commission has funded a lot of districts to get their PER done, get design done. So a lot of them are ready for some construction money. So I know there's different pots of money that the feds and the state are putting away for water, wastewater, electrical, and stuff like that. That's where we think those other parties could pop in. Uh, the, the other one is our next with the OT special appropriation that was in there. Uh, we did apply for some funding through the DOT's office. I talked to the Secretary uh, Cerno yesterday a little bit about <coughs> that. They should be making a decision on those funding um, in December, but those are planning. Once we get the planning, then we're going to need some money to actually build them. So those are other stuff. So um, one of the big things is um, we're in we're in specific need of um, a new command unit for the sheriff's office, a DWI uh, battle mill. So that's a big one. They're about three to four hundred thousand. Ours is very old, but we need a new one. Uh, they have it out almost every weekend around the county, and they're about due for a new one. So um, those are our parties in a nutshell, but um, if Commissioner Bach or Commissioner Moore want to add to it, uh, you're welcome. Real quick, we look at the, the carbon coal road development, and what we're looking at with this, on um, completing this, is to try to keep the commercial traffic out of the residential area. The residential area is meant one. So right now with the carbon coal road that we have built, we have one way in and then it's a dirt road if they decide to take that. What we would like to do is complete this project right here and to keep all that commercial traffic off of that and keep it on that carbon road, carbon coal road extension. So that would help us a lot. It would also help that community. They're going to be with a lot of truck traffic going up and down that road. Is it a safety issue? I worked with commercial vehicles for almost 30 years. It is. It's, it's serious. And we all know how truck traffic is on I-40. Now take that and put some of that truck traffic down in the residential area. That's a serious issue. I'd like to see we work on that traffic at the house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
do what's best for our community. Thank you. Uh, and I know I have a few more minutes left, and I had asked staff when Representative Lundstrom and Representative Johnson asked what we're doing with projects. And, and we do have a grant manager. Uh, she takes care of them. Um, so I just wanted to go quickly through them. We did get some money for county-wide bridges. We got 200000 Uh We only have 12000 of that left, so we've been spending that down. Uh, at County Road 1, um, we have 300000 to update that. We're holding on to that to see what was going to happen with the Carbon Coal Road because we got a bunch of County Road 1, so we're trying to decide where that's going. Um, Top of Water Association, we got money for that. That's all spent down on a actual PER. Um, the Arm Shade Brilliant Center, we got money a couple years for, for that. Uh, 750000 We only have, I think, 12000 left in that. That's done. We're probably going to close that out. Uh, we got money to help plan and design the uh, jail. We spent all that money down. That was 100,000. The industrial park, we got 420,000, I think, in 21. Uh, and we're almost done with that. We use that for different studies, environmental, different things out at our park. So we'll be cutting those down. Uh, Savannah so County's building, uh, we did some 90,000. We worked on their building. I think that's all, that's getting ready to close out. Uh, community pantry got a little bit of money. We helped them with their flooring and the roof. Uh, so we're doing that on them. And a lot of these sometimes, they come through the county, but they're not necessarily county project, but we're the fiscal agent to help those other agencies. Uh, RMCH HVAC, we're working on that. Um, the design, like I said, that's all spent. That's what gave us the best to give 50000 and we designed the whole building on what's going to be needed next, and that's what we're working on. That'll be closed. Uh, we got um, $1.5 uh, for Battle families to remodel their building. That's currently going on now. Uh, it's across the street from the COG, across the street from City Hall. They're going to start gutting that pretty soon and they'll have a new, uh, battle, a new remodeled Battle family intake building. Uh, we're also in the process of closing the deal on the East Campus, as Senator Munoz is asking. Uh, we should close in the next week or so and that will be our building and then we're working on a lease agreement with Four Corners Four Corners Recovery. They are talking with their CEO and their chairman, uh, me and Commissioner Baca met with them about a month ago. Uh, they're ready to move in. They're, they're excited because they want to go to a 180-day treatment program in our area. So uh, we're just a matter of changing hands. Uh, we are going to need some money to remodel it. Uh, we're going to have a study done to check the HVAC, the boilers, the heaters, all the infrastructure to make sure that's working. But they are very excited, ready to move in. So. Um, Sheriff's vehicle money we, we got, that's already spent. Um, a lot of our projects are much, majority spent down. I mean, we don't, we got someone on top of it. We have a project meeting every month. We know where our money's at. We know that's being spent. So uh, those are just capital. We also have House Bill Junior money, that kind of money. But on these capital outlay projects that we get uh, for us and other entities, we're, we're pretty much right on top of them and we're, and we're spending the money down. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually have something for you to sign off on. Um, currently working with the hospital and their CEO and their chairman, um, we're not able to get enough staff for the two, to the two clinics. Currently, uh, we are going to ask for a re-off to put money back into the hospital. And I think it's 120,000. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's 600 last year and 600 what, what the year before. Some came from Patty, some from you, a little bit from, from George, some from the, from the governor, but yeah, it's all in there. And I have the reauthorization forms already ready. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the report. I uh, wanted to ask about the rural water system. Thank you very much. You need to stand around here. <laughs> 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 On the uh, rural water system, the district looking at setting up as an authority. Because I've been told by people in San Jose they are. So we have a regional authority that got started running up now. 
And right now there's only three entities that are in it, which is Whitefish, Yapa A, and Gamerco. So the county's been helping them establish this authority because right now we were having in the past, we've had several different entities coming at once to the county and asking for money. And, and the county's been very good. We've been helping everybody get up to date, get their PER done, get ready to kind of design. But it's getting to the point where we need to establish one regional authority. So instead of 30 people coming and asking, we got one going to the authority, they come into us and the city saying, hey, we're ready. These are our, our priorities and we're moving forward. But we are helping them still. Uh, we hired someone to help them. We hired an um, uh, attorney who specializes in that stuff. So it is up and running. Uh, I think it's been a few months. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I'll kind of leave the bear of that news. And, and maybe, I know Robert's here. Are, are we really going to accomplish a COVID plan? Because there's seven million, six or seven million in that. They're going to bring that project list from the office. I mean, are we really going to accomplish it? No, and that's what we were just saying that they, uh, we can't, between us and this uh, RMCH, we don't have enough people working to fill the two clinics, so they want to reauthorize the 1.2 back into the hospital. And, and that's what we currently have is 1.2. 1.2 in the COVID? Yes. So we're going to be looking for a reauthorization the COVID clinic. Yes. The Berkeley Center, that's all complete. The 750 is complete, but they could use more of them. I'm mistaken, Robert, right? We could use a lot more of that. Yeah. But isn't it true that we don't have any obstetricians or, or birthing doctors in our speech? And, and so we built something nice that's collecting dust. I mean, I, I don't, we're going to have to, we're going to get into this conversation on our speech a little bit later and really how we fix it. The domestic violence that that capital appropriation was for new infrastructure, I think. And it came from this exact with us pushing on the exact. And, and we're doing a new one. It, and it wasn't the intent. I know the legislative intent was for a new domestic violence. Why are we pushing back? I know she came with a crazy uh, $22 million dream and it went way in the wrong direction. I mean, why are we not following the legislative intent instead of uh, probating a new detox center? I'm sorry, domestic exactly violence center and, and the handle. So I, I'm not sure about the legislative intent, but I do know that it was over $18 million for a new domestic violence, what, what she wanted. And we started getting down to the nuts and bolts working with her. Uh, we had to go with what was realistic and what was manageable and what we could obtain at the time. And we had 1.5 at that time. And so we did the best we could and plan, design, remodel, and that's what we're doing now. Um, let me ask you about the carbon coal. But well, before we do that, we just do the bridge right there. How does that bridge even fall on the road to the semi that you're going to have to throw over two lane bridge from a four lane road? No, no, that, that's the point of making it accessible for regular vehicles and push all the heavy equipment through carbon coal. Um, let me ask some other questions. Uh, where are we at the federal funds? Is it the state appropriation in the federal government that is in charge of the care of our uh, or I can't remember the name yet. Uh, we spent last year's ARPA already. Uh, we're still, we haven't uh, moved on this year's ARPA, uh, which came in May, but last year's ARPA is already spent. We use it on public safety. And it's my understanding all ARPA has to be under contract at the end of this month. After the end of contract, it's extended in two years. Yeah, it's my understanding, but I'm not sure we're good. So we'll be done with that this year uh, as we were with the care of mine. This is a detox center. I think that 1.5 was directly for design or model purchase, right? Yeah. Because that they thought that. So you have the detox money in your hands and, and capable to do that. Yep, we're, we're getting ready to close. Uh, hopefully, as soon as we get some documents, we've been working with Robert and his staff. As soon as we get software that we both need to put for the title company, it'll be close. But the, the, the capital appropriation from the legislature was to purchase and buy and purchase. So you won't need any additional money in the detox center because that has been done through capital already. That's been funny to purchase. We still need money to remodel it. I'm ready to my capital in. I'll, I'll make some argument later, but the capital appropriation is always designed to purchase and uh, 
remodel, mm -hmm. whatever, in the language. And so that should have that flexibility. So, so I want to make sure that we, we get there with more quarter and, and how we do that. So, but I think the language is there to do that. I just want to make sure that the top money is not moved over for a different purpose than what it was intended to do for the workload. Thank you. No, we wouldn't move the money over. We separate it by each project into their own budget, their own fund. We we keep track of it, particularly. Um, and it was 1.3, I think, something like that, to purchase. Uh, the county is actually spending, putting more money of our own money to get that done. And then we'll be looking money to remodel. I have one comment I wanted to share with everybody also. Is that uh, we've become a lot more transparent when it comes to capital outlay. And there's a portal that you can log into at this time, and you can see exactly who puts money where. I know in the old days there was some confusion about that, but not anymore. Uh, if you are interested to know who put money into what project, there's a, a portal to look at it. Yeah, I, I have that, and the commission has that. We know the last couple of years who who's funded what and who has the funded what. Thank you. Go ahead, Representative. Uh, well, I'd like to the conversation of uh, the about the that have the capacity for the support of the people the first to wish everybody a good afternoon because it's exactly 12 o'clock if I read my, my, my phone right. Anyway, uh, my name is Louis Bonaguidi and I am the mayor of Gallup. Uh, with me today, I have uh, three of my city councilors. I have Fran Polacek, Linda Garcia, and Mike Schopp sitting at the back there. And also with my staff uh, support, actually I've got C.B. Strain with Public, Public Works Department. And uh, Marianne uh, Music is not here today. She is sick, so CB is now our acting uh, city manager at this point. We also have Adrian Marufo back here, who is our water, wastewater, and solid waste department. And uh, uh, we have Alicia Santiago. She is with us. So anyway, uh, uh, and we also have our lobbyist, Charlie Marcus, sitting back here. And I appreciate him coming down because... Uh, it's going to be uh, in his court probably in the near, near future. I'm going to try to be as brief as I can because uh, uh, the detail work is going to be with CB. So anyway, uh, the first thing I want to bring up is the large projects. Our large projects, of course, is uh, uh, water wells. Uh, we were supposed to get the Navajo Gallup pipeline in 2024. But uh, things have changed, and now they're telling us it's going to be around 2030 by the time we get the water lines in. So our, our engineers are telling us we're running out of water. And they also tell us that we need eight wells. We do have funding for sit for two, and so we're looking for funding for six more. Our wastewater treatment plant, as you can as we we're, we're, the city or the community seems to be uh, on a roll here. We don't have enough housing, and... Uh, the county is pushing uh, things to, to, to expand on, so we're, we definitely need a wastewater treatment uh, uh, plant. And the next item is the uh, cast iron lines. 
Uh, we also found, I don't know if anybody knows about Flint, Flint Michigan, uh, the situation they have. Well, we're faced with the same situation. We're going from well water to uh, uh, river water. And so there's going to be a cross-contamination situation. Uh, I think that our engineers have identified something like 27 miles of, of cast iron water lines that have to be replaced. Our capital outlay, uh, Regional Senior Citizen Center, uh, we have $5 million for that. It's regional, I mean, that includes everything uh, in McKinley County and parts of Arizona for that matter. It's, it's a regional, it's going to be a beautiful facility, but we, we need more funding for it. Uh, regional animal shelter, you know, I mean, uh, we have a major problem with uh, with our, our uh, uh, strays and uh, uh, livestock. I mean, we're, we, we're in partnership with the county and also working with the Navajo Nation on, on our situation, so we definitely need a shelter, the facility we've got. We, in fact, we recently purchased, we're in the process of purchasing that property. Uh, we've negotiated, negotiations have ended, but then Dr. Bellick passed away a few weeks ago, so we're waiting to get title of that to get that done. Uh, our, our turf replacement, uh, you know, that's another regional facility in a sense because the people that use our facilities, our, our baseball fields, it's not only the schools that are in the surrounding area, but we got, we got baseball teams and, that come in from out of state for that matter to use our facilities. And we're trying to replace uh, four fields with, with turf, so we need support on that. And of course, water, wastewater lines, as I had mentioned before, if we're going to go through any kind of growth, our wastewater treatment plan is already outdated and it's going to definitely need, need, need support. Our other priorities, uh, Red Rock Park. Uh, uh, recently in October, we signed a, a, a partnership agreement with the county. Uh, if you're familiar with Red Rock Park, it's a 50-year-old facility. It's a crown jewel for us, for sure. But the problem is, uh, as, as the city of Yallop basically running it, all we've been able to do is band-aid it for the past years. And so we've, we've signed off on an agreement with the county, and we're, we're hoping that we can you know, turn that crown jewel into something bigger and better as to what it should be. Uh, the next step is uh, support rural air service. We've got rural air service right now. It has been very successful, but we need we need we need the state state to to help us to keep it for sure. Uh, Allison Corridor and I-40 with the, the two entrances on the east side and the west side of I-40 needs needs help, and then of course we need the Allison Corridor facility. Uh, Houseville Tool Junior Fund, Police Services behavior, health, and animal control services. We need the support in that. Anyway, I'm going to, give it, I'm going to turn this over to CB so that uh, he can give you the technical end of all of these, and if there's any questions, he can answer them. Uh, this particular project is to plan, design, construct, furnish, equip uh, a new senior center for the senior citizens uh, for the city of Gallup and McKinley County. Uh, we do have this on our ICIP list uh, that we submit to the state every year uh, for funding. Um, the project impact for this project uh, will serve, this project will serve about 350 uh, seniors uh, in Gallup and surrounding, uh, surrounding communities. And uh, these amenities will also support other centers throughout the county. Uh, total project cost for this project is $14,500,000. Uh, to funded to date, we have uh, almost six million five million nine hundred fifteen thousand three hundred dollars. We're anticipating another five million to be funded this year. Uh, so what our request is going to be this year for capital outlay is two million dollars. That'll get us not all the way to pr uh, construction money, but close. We'll be about two million short, uh, but we'll be able to apply the following year. But we will have a shovel-ready project. The design um, is currently being tweaked a little bit. This is a rendering of what the project will look like. Um, and this particular project will be at, let me see if I can find the laser. Nope. Uh, the Harold Reynolds uh, uh, Athletic Facility on the north side, just east or just west of that, that's where this project is going to be. Uh, the project consists of a new regional senior center and a recreational center, which would be phase 
three of this project. That's not included in this funding that we're asking for today. Um, the, the, the senior center itself is broken up into two phases. The yellow middle section there is the first phase, and the green section is the second phase. However, the $14 million price tag covers the entire phase one and phase two of the project. So it's, it's not just for phase one. As I said, uh, the uh, project, uh, we're not going to get all the way to construction, but it will be shovel ready and this will get us really close. And we, I think with next year's ask, we should be able to go to construction probably uh, next spring sometime or maybe next fall. Uh, this project is sorely needed for our uh, senior citizens throughout the county and the city. They use it quite frequently. Uh, and our seniors are, uh, you know, the reason why we're here. So we've got to take care of them. I'll stand for any questions on the senior center if you have any. Yes, ma'am. Um, you be glad you're back, back in the saddle. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, the sources today, is that all coming to the state? And you know, you apply to the aging program and then it gets into the bond process. Is it all coming from the state so far? Yes, the, the, we have 5.4 million that was awarded through GO bonds. Okay. Uh, we haven't received it yet, but it's in process. Okay. Uh, and we're applying for the, another 7.5 million. We anticipate we'll get about 5 million out of that application. Okay, good. That's what I want to make sure that that's the right source. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just, just on that point, if you do put the agreement with the Asian Department of Health, if you just put the funding, that they don't get that much funding right. this year, so it's not a five million in the first year and five million in the second year. But don't be a gap and that's what we're thinking about before it's up to the gap that they're gonna have. And again, if you can find out if it's in the L C uh, framework, that would be helpful to see if anything uh going to come through with that funding. and I know they have a separate process for this one. Thank no, the design is actually almost done. The, the entire, that's what we have funded to date is 5950000 So um, I would have to give you a breakdown on, if you want a breakdown on what we spent to date for design only. You know, what I want you to do for this is to come back to the full amount of question. $14 million is the full amount, right? That's the total cost minus the $5 million for $9 million if you're asking for additional fees. Ask for the full amount so we can finish the project. I want that. <laughs> um, it would be an additional about $2 million. So it would be about $4 million total. <laughs> this is the problem. Capital outlay. We cannot teach me no capital and let it sit there for that many years, especially with a project like this. Right? No, I agree. We call with one, we open one, we pop with one group, we pop with another group, and there was a war. We hired a ship, fix that problem completely at one time, and finish it. So, just set it for the capital request for the total dollar amount, and we'll make sure that that happens. Great. Any other questions on Senior Center? Okay, next project that the city would like to present is the artificial turf. Oops, sorry. Artificial turf replacements for our, our recreational parks. This would be for the Fort Canyon Recreational Facility and the, the uh, sports complex. Uh, the worst, the the complex of the, in the worst condition is Fort Canyon. Those turfs have been there for probably 30 years, and they have not been replaced. The uh, the life for an artificial turf is between five and ten years. Uh, it's become a safety hazard now. Um, as you know, all of our youth play on those fields. We have the summer ball leagues. We have soccer. We have they use them for practice fields for Miamura. Um, so the turfs are in, in dire need of replacement. Uh, as I said, we're surprised they've lasted this long, but but they are starting to deteriorate pretty bad. Um, we have in order to replace the the turf. The, the, the fields that need to be replaced, the, the total project cost is going to be fourteen million five hundred thousand. We know that's a lot, it's a, it's a huge ask, and that's not going to happen. But what we can do, we have funded to date five million. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm on the senior center again. 
יופי. Total cost is six million. That's a lot better. Six million six hundred thousand for some change um, to turf all the fields that need to be turfed. Uh, again, we know that's a huge ask, but we do have three hundred fifty thousand dollars funded to date. Um, we're asking for. Uh, we applied for to the uh, land and water conservation funds, uh, which, as you know. Uh, it's like a 50-50 thing. We apply for 250, so we'll give 250. Uh, that will bring us to about 850 thousand dollars, which will allow us to do about two fields. So the two fields that would need to be done first would be at the Fort Canyon Sports Complex. Uh, again, our, our capital outlay request is for 250 thousand. That'll give it, give us the money to do the most critical fields at this time. But the total cost for all the needs is. $6.6 million. Let me ask you, my capital is so that I gave you $250,000. Yeah. 20 and 22, right? You're, asking, you're just asking for an additional 200000 We're asking for an additional 250000 so we can turf two fields at this time. Thank you. And no more questions on the sure. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, I can't. You're needing uh, six point six million dollars. You got uh three hundred and fifty thousand funded. Why are you only asking for two hundred and fifty thousand? Doesn't make sense to me. Why are you not requesting six million bucks? Uh, uh, you we know, you've got some shares of finance here. Why are you asking for six million dollars? I'd like to ask for the amount for all of these projects, but we know the reality is uh, funds are very limited. But no, I agree. I mean, if, if the thing is, if you're going to ask for $250,000, it's probably going to be ignored. So if you're going to ask for $6 million, you've got a good chance of getting at least a million. So uh, let's put another I mean, you need $6 million. Bucks. Yeah, that's what you got to ask for. And you come up to uh, friend here. My friend over there, and my friend over there, and myself, and uh, Senator Pinto, and you ask us for six million dollars, and then you tell us, and then we'll tell you what we can do. Sure. You can't come up to us and say, I want $250,000 to do a $6 million project. I'm going to take care of your right. 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 You're just asking. Well, I want to see $100,000 house. I can only afford a $50,000 trailer. Any more questions on the turf? No. Okay, moving on to the regional uh, animal shelter. This has been a long time coming. The regional uh, animal shelter, as you know, is in very bad shape. That building has been pieced together over the years. Uh, actually, it had uh, um, a wood stove in it that heated it for <laughs> ever, uh, which did not need code, by the way. But anyway, they got that fixed, so they do have central heat now. Um, this project is to design, construct, furnish, equip a, a new regional senior center, uh, and we do have a JPA with the. Uh, I'm stuck on that senior center, man. Animal shelter. Uh, and Humane Society. Uh, we do have a joint powers agreement with the county, so we do serve the county as well. It's a city-county deal that uh, my staff goes out and patrols. Here. I wonder if I put that picture on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably the call. <laughs> 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 
Right now, uh, it is on our ICIP, and, and uh, it'll it'll replace the existing facility. And we did finally pick the site. It will be where the existing site is now, or the facility is now. Um, total project cost for this is 14 million, a little over 14 million dollars. Right now, funded to date, we have 811 million dollars, which was contributions to Senator Munoz and Representative Lundstrom.
COVID blew the water situation out totally completely out of it, out of place. And there's a great human need and there's a great animal need, but uh, I mean, a $5 million uh, animal shelter should be able to accomplish that to some issue. To realistically prioritize human needs. <laughs> and believe me, I've got to more to own and dogs and oh, how many cats. But there's got to be some of the realism of what we need to do to all uh, right, now is the time to do it because we haven't done a formal design yet, so we've done very conceptual things. But just to give you an idea of, of what we deal with up there, we probably take in close to 4,000 animals a year at the facility, and uh, a lot of them are adopted out, but with COVID, as Senator Mignot said, it killed everything. We haven't been able to adopt out animals. They come and transport. When they used to transport 30 or 40 a week, they're transporting out maybe four or five. And cats, they're not transporting out at all. We have a major cat problem here in this town with the overpopulation of cats. So um, there is a need, but yes, we will look at that and see what we can do as far as value engineering it down some more and come up with something Next is uh, water wastewater line replacement. Um, what we're asking for here is a two million dollar ask, and this is mainly to have funding to be able to repair existing lines that break on a probably weekly basis throughout the city. We're always trying to fix lines and patch lines, and we don't really have a solid funding source to take care of this. So it, 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 this is something that's ongoing. It's never, we're never going to get caught up. I mean, if we're looking at replacing all the lines in Gallup, we're looking about $30 million. So that's, that's not going to happen with one ask. So what we're asking for is at least money that we could maintain our existing infrastructure and repair it as needed. Um, and we have Adrian Marufo here with the water wastewater department. He could, he could, uh, Testified to uh, how often these lines break, and it's fairly often. And when we're starting to have main lines break now, that that puts the neighborhoods out of uh, commission for a number of hours. And these are probably 30, 40, or more residents that are out of water <laughs> for that period of time. So we need the funding to keep up with these breaks. And it's it's not a city at Gallup probably, it's a problem throughout the country, but our infrastructure is very old. It's very, very old and we, we fix and patch where we can, but it's like, uh, <laughs> excuse the pun, but chasing water uphill, it's, it's, it's tough. So first of this, several million that you have available for the I put a memo together and figured the question about the water priority and so which water would come up. These are all the actions that the city of Gallup has taken. Uh, they put their finger in every pie that's out there. Uh, some of the problems that the legislature know is some of that money uh, came down and it's being used as loans. Uh, since the city of Gallup doesn't really have the capacity, they down more debt at this time. Um, so some of, some of those programs, if we could treat them to be grant only, uh, especially with the uh, circumstances in the gala, uh, would be helpful. But they provide the water trust board, the clean water drinking, clean water revolving loan fund, drinking water revolving loan fund. Uh, we've got mayor shot us down several times. Uh, and uh, Mike Hammond, the state engineer, uh, but some of these, these problems that Gallup faces are, are big. I mean, the, the wastewater, uh, as Gallup can be, can try to add jobs and create economic development. Wastewater treatment is going to be a big deal. Um, obviously, the way in that from Gallup, the wells have become a big deal. 
But these, these, these outages that we have signed by the really an issue that we can use the legislature's help um, not with capital outlays, but just helping us get into some of these programs um, and making them more accessible for places like Dallas that have uh, limited capacity. Um, the other thing is the city has been talking and will probably take action in December on a water rate increase of some nature uh, so that they can start taking care of this backlog um, issue. Um, but again, um, the amount of money that's needed um, um, needs some, some attention, I guess, from those folks that have those set of funds. I've been on it, I guess, is the answer, but we can use your help yet to go finish on some of this stuff. That's all the three Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask one question. If you could, if, if you said, Gal, we can be county, right? Got the A, the whole regional water system, right? I know we're going south of the Red Rock and, and all this regional water system. Could you get a number together? Like, I know we put 8 million for wells last year, right? There's 8 million that come through the wells. I mean, well, what is the water line? What is the total package? Of the if you had the money to do it all at once, I believe the Paul Engineering did do a survey of our uh, infrastructure for just the city of Gallup, and that number, as I mentioned before, came up to about $30 million to replace all the way. But get us a package for the water, the, the, the sewer treatment, and that don't hold because who's that first place? Because those, those water lines going out there can be impacted on the material. This is an everything center for those three large projects. For 55 more hours a year for elementary students and 60 more hours for secondary students. Um, this will help uh, us better prepare students who come to us with the low grade level. Uh, we also have issue with since the time that this was implemented, the number of hours. Assessment has played a much bigger part in education. Um, and so more time is taken away from actual instruction. And then also with respect to the pandemic, obviously there's a lot of other losses in place to help us uh, to move forward and to come back to Sure. that is the flexibility piece comes when you talk about hours and not days. Okay. And so this solution, is everybody going to be happy? No. But on average, because it's already built into the law this way anyway, just by increasing the hours okay. allows there to be more consensus. Even though I know that you're hearing, and I'm hearing it too from other superintendents, 
that they don't want it extra time, they don't need it, etc. Uh, we actually had a call this morning with superintendents. We actually had this exact discussion. Um, there is, I think it was pretty prevalent in that meeting this morning that this is likely to happen. Quit trying to fight it, but let's make sure that it's flexible so the school districts can use the hours how they need how they need to use them. And so we're not tied down with like the way that it currently is implemented as far as extended learning. Um, so I don't, I don't, I know that you're hearing that, but I think it's going to dwindle um, as far as there's some few loud voices and squeaky wheels out there. Uh, but I, I think in the end, this is this is the only way that we can get past this. Um, and so when they raise hell, they don't like what we're doing, and then all of a sudden, 23 little house members come forward and say, we don't like this. We don't care for the kind of legislative watch at the end of the day. But I, I just really hope that we can get um, everybody on the same track here. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not an education professional. I don't know what works. But I do know that we are responsible for putting together a fair budget. And that we want things evaluated. We want we want outcomes for the kids and for the, everybody that's part of it. But at the end of the day, that's pretty hard to develop if you have a lot of fluctuation between districts. That's all I'm trying to say. And I understand, just, I mean, I don't fully understand APS situation, but I would suspect that there's been a lot of inefficiency there over the years, and it's a monster. Um, and maybe maybe part of the reason they don't want to is because they're already struggling financially and with their own inefficiencies. And so adding more days, worrying that worrying about whether it would be completely funded or not, maybe one of their concerns, I don't know. But now that I know which district you're talking about, I'll, I'll have a conversation about that. Part of it is, is that when we follow a state statute on how they're the funding formula for the public is very complicated for public education. It's one of the most complicated funding formulas I've ever worked with. And what ends up happening, we by law have to follow that at the state level. Let's tell us the and the science committee do that. Lots of things are added, particularly below what we call below the line, but basically the funding formula is based on human value for kids. My issue has always been is when that budget is, is, is allocated as a pension contribution, when it goes to that particular school district, they set up their own formula with that money. They have they run their own pension programs, they run their own insurance programs. So it really isn't fair to be able to say that you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, so that that's the deal here, and uh, and we have to get a we have to get a sense from what everybody else thinks that, and if they're going to be an island to themselves, because one of the threats I've had from the LOC staff, I want to know where that money's going. When I have him on TV saying we haven't got enough money, and then the Fed secretary saying yes, you did. I want to know how much of the rent is their pension fund. You know, things like that, that you guys would never see that. So we have the opportunity to get into it. But it affects what happens here, because those were the districts that were raising the most health years ago when we were trying to get impact aid through. And I think the public needs to know that. That when we were out there working on impact aid for everybody here, uh, those school districts that were fighting us the hardest for those that had the most flexibility and the most legislative. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Let me ask you something. Sure. Did Yadi Martinez talk about this thing to expect to extend the legislature along with COVID at work? And the legislature has to respond to that. And our response was, or the requirements from the job that I've done. I mean, that was a lot of time. Now, certain school districts comply in terms of health, but a lot of that human child is not comply because they need new teachers push back into what I can do. But other than this mandate, and that's because this is the meeting before, right? We're going to apply a mandate to something. It's going to have to be done in order to give those students because you know what Mr. Chief said, that's right. Like, and it's not for New Mexico. And so, how do we get that? I mean, I'm not sure. I'm married to a retired teacher now. And, and 
how do we get the third grade to decide on that? How do we have it? Is that the only thing that can be the performance? And I don't know how we target that. I mean, I mean, these are all legislative responses to the young market. That we have to mandate and that school can show me to do for order of to get out and learn that often. And that's really what the problem is, is you're, the way we're doing student learning now, we can't participate. We can't participate either. We're just like pals. The union won't let us. They don't, they, they're looking, even no matter how much we're going to pay teachers, they don't want to do it. And so the only way that you can have flexibility is to use the current law and just increase the hours. I think that's the simplest way, and I think you're going to have the best chance of success. Oh, you want to Yeah, absolutely. You go anywhere, in any business and they can't buy, they can't be things, sellers, everywhere. And part of it is that learning loss from less instruction time and over the time with, like I said, assessment and those types of things. Uh, and with students coming to the school districts, especially in our area, uh, they're below grade levels, even sometimes years when they're just starting school. Uh, it's a significant challenge. So. On the next item, unless there's another question on that one. Now the cost for that, I didn't put it on there. I know there's debates between LFC and LESC and analysts, um, but I think they're about 100 million off of each other from what I last, I, last discussion I had. Um, but it's probably going to take a little bit more, more than 100 million for that. Um, the next item uh, has to do with Indian education funding. Uh, and for Gallatin County, County Schools, it costs us for classroom instruction, the Indian, Indian, Indian Education Act, about $3 million. Um, we do get some funding uh, through the formula, um, but other dollars are given to the public education department to satisfy that. And so I wanted to provide you uh, what that looks like when you give dollars to PED to satisfy the Indian Education Act. And you can look at the discrepancy. Here's um, school districts, and I provided a copy for you too on your table so you can see it. Um, but if you look at the bottom part of that, uh, dollars per student on the very bottom right-hand side, all the districts in the northwest corner of the state are receiving the least amount of dollars per student funding on average than the rest of the, the state. Um, because what happens is the dollars are given to PED, they have below the line funding applications and they distribute how they want. Um, and so what we're advocating for is that um, we do that funding per pupil through a formula so that all Native American students are receiving the funding equitably uh, throughout the state of New Mexico. Um, it's rough, this is rough, uh, because your analysts are much, much, much better at this than we are, but rough estimates are approximately, I think you have 15 million this year, I think it'll actually only take about 12 million to satisfy the instructional needs of Native American and heritage language teachers. Um, and, and, and by formula, not through PED. Look at what that loss to Albuquerque would be. That's the problem with waiting. I don't, know that, I don't think there would be a loss to Albuquerque. They would get more money. Yeah, they're only receiving for their students is two hundred six dollars a student. How many students? We have five thousand students. It's still, still not a lot. I mean, we're spending $3 million, so they should, they, they would actually get an increase of that. Percentage-wise of the state of Native American students in Albuquerque, they would actually get an increase. And that would be including all charter schools and everything? And you shall see, if you look on your list, I wasn't able to show it on this slide, but there's a bunch of other schools below that with zero. Um, and, and maybe it's their fault they didn't apply for the money, etc. but in the end, why are we having an application for the Indian Education Act um, when it's mandated by law um, that we provide the services? Let's do it by formula so that we're treating students equitably across the state. There's a lot of categories of funds that are below the line that people apply for. It's not just this one, which I've never understood either. And every time we talk about moving to the local line, but so putting with the funding formula, there's an outrage about that. Um, we like it where it is because it's about control at the end of the day, and, you know, by the head department. And who gives what? But I think that's what we come out of the next year with the governor's budget. 
it's going to be three times more below the line. That's what we're hearing. <coughs> That probably goes off another issue as far as is is the Secretary of Education the best the best way to lead education in New Mexico or, or do we want to look back at some past practices as far as how that's structured and maybe that's in my opinion it's too politicized right now and that's what happens if you get money so you can spend it the way that you want it and then there's a distri distribution like that where our students are extremely underfunded and yet the other rest of the state um, the, the ones least on the top end of this are, are heavily funded. Lastly, uh, we have obviously been very re heavily reliant on uh, pandemic-related federal funds for technology. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of work on, on your part in helping with infrastructure and those types of things in New Mexico for Internet. Uh, and But there's also a significant need that I think after next year is going to kind of be in everybody's face is trying to keep up with the technology demands and needs of our students when those federal funds are gone. Um, it costs us about $5 million for the internet needs currently and also the replacement costs for technology as far as laptops and, and iPads. Um, that is something that there's some opportunities for property rich districts to get dollars for that with our bonding capacity um, being significantly taking a hit as of late, uh, just making it increasingly more difficult. It'll, it'll be even more difficult for us to keep up with technology for all of our students. And we're not the only ones. Um, a, lot of, a lot of rural New Mexico will have, will have struggles. So um, we didn't put a cost estimate, but if you multiply that out, and we're about 4% of the student population in New Mexico, just in replacement costs, even though some people don't have the internet issues that we do as far as getting service, um, even for low-speed internet, uh, probably a hundred million dollars approximately for the state of Mexico to, for replacement for technology every four years. So Mike, we have the impact state money right now. Mm -hmm. This is all the service and technology. Why are you using the impact state money? Right here in the mobile hotspot and the overall world. Absolutely. No, I understand that. And I think that's kind of what happens a lot is um, we get told We'll use your impact aid money for this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. When you lost bonding capacity, when construction costs are skyrocketing, we have a 200 million plus dollar deficit in our in our infrastructure problems in our, in our school system. And so those dollars, yes, we can use probably some of that, but um, we're still digging ourselves out of an infrastructure problem. And so it's going to take some time. Uh, it, there's only so many dollars, so. Um, you know, if, if, if this was a, if we had the power plants here and those types of things, and we had some other things going on, and even greater economic development, um, we may have more bonding capacity. We could be like the property wealthy areas, uh, but those dollars go go quickly with the costs that are associated with technology, construction, etc. That we're putting those impact aid dollars to. Um, that's pretty much our end of our presentation. Uh, we know there hasn't been as much conversation maybe about the replacement cost of technology, uh, and maybe I'm wrong in that. I haven't heard that from LESC or LSC as much other than the bandwidth piece, uh, but I think that's something that you need, to, you need to be aware of is coming soon, uh, and it's going to be across the state, not just in our area, but that, that cost is going to be uh, something we need to pay attention to if we're going to continue to provide uh, laptops and those types of things for every student. Hi, everybody. I'm Sabrina Ezell. I'm the interim chancellor at UNM Gallup. And I have with me today Ron Petronovich, who is the director of our facilities management department. So um, when I stepped into this position in March, um, at my first planning meeting for the uh, GeoBond 2020 project in April, I learned that we were $1.8 million over budget. And I was advised that this was due to the increase in construction, in, in cost of construction materials. And so they said, you know, something's going to have to be cut. And so I learned that they were recommending that the construction technology building portion of this project be, be removed. 
and that would really negatively impact our campus and the needs of our students. And it was the intention of the GeoBond uh, 2020 to renovate that area. So um, if we could get that funding, it would provide us with the larger, um, large assembly multi-use construction lab, dedicated classrooms, dedicated computer lab, a plot room, fabrication lab, large construction yard, dedicated covered construction space, and sufficient space for material storage and truck access. Um, I just I learned about the supplemental option when I attended the summer hearings. I wasn't aware of this. I'm, I'm new to this position. I'm new to this role. So when I found out about it, um, I wanted to explore it more. And when I uh, spoke with HED, they said that they would recommend um, this for supplemental funding. So um, that is my first project um, to present. <coughs> the next item that I have that is also on the ICIP list is um, the r and funds for infrastructure improvements across our campus. And I do have some photos here. Nothing tells a story like a picture. So what you see here, we're going to have um, HVAC upgrades, roof replacement, um, the F&D parking lot um, needs to be, um, what do we call that, graded, needs to be graded, and we have skylight replacements. So replacing the rooftop heating and cooling units on Calvin Hall will ensure continuing comfort levels and reduce maintenance costs. The roof on the nursing building has been repaired multiple times and is in need of replacement. This will reduce future maintenance costs. Skylights in Calvin Hall and career education are worn and in need of replacement. And we have, um, as I mentioned, our parking lot that is in front of one of our fairly new buildings was not graded properly and it also has a gravel top. And so it makes driving on that surface difficult and there's actually a safety issue associated with that. So we are asking for funding um, to make all of these repairs across the campus. And that, those are my two projects that will be recommended by HED. Let me ask you something. Where's the mayor? The mayor of that works for Sabrina is going for an interview on Tuesday to become the UNM director. She's a local person. She cares about that university. So if, if I were you guys and we really want a director that really is connected to us and cares about what's happening at UNM Gallo, we need to make that call to UNM the president and say, you know, this is who we want in our community. Sorry to put you in this position. <laughs> but for 15 years, <laughs> I've watched uh, how you filmed it in San Jose that ran that school. <laughs> I've watched the guy on Facebook. I've watched another guy come in that never was here, never cared about the community and the things that were happening. So this is an opportunity, I think, for me, especially me, because I think that's one of the best things that we have. I may not like UNM every single day because what they, they do. I think as a community, if you really want a director, lives here, that cares about the students, you need to make that call today or tomorrow to that UNM president and say, you got one choice and this is it. Um, I don't know how to say but this is, this is an opportunity for us to have someone that I respect, that lives here, that we know about, that's been there forever, and the nursing program, one of the most successful in, in, in UNM, and has done very well. I'm sorry to put you in that position, but I'm going to ask you one tough question to Jeff and Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> How much does UNM take from UNM Gallup when we pay our property tax, the mill levy, right? All that money, I know that money is transferred to Albuquerque, and then they take an operational percentage off that, and they never send it back to Gallup. Can you get me that number that UNM Albuquerque maintains? Sure. 
sucks out of the community and then never gets back to tax dollars that we pay for you. That's really important to me. The other thing is, is when you know, UNM, you propose these projects to UNM. UNM guides them, and then UNM sends a different list to the legislature. That's always been a problem for us because they get to select what the applicants. It's not us as legislators, and this one got crossways with my wife in the last minute. We don't select those. UNM selects them and sends them to the legislature. So when you send this election to UNM, you need a little love letter from Senator McGill saying that <laughs> these projects need to be done and exceeded themselves. I'm fine with that. I'm okay. sorry to put you in that position, but I think you're the best person that we can get in the last 15 years of that industry. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Senator, I would like to, I would like to just share with you, thank you for acknowledging that situation we can attempt to get out. We deal with it the Gallup and we've dealt with that for years. No, and it hurts us tremendously because we don't we're a small institution, you know, we're in comparison. And the funding that we get for some of these basic infrastructure repairs that are needed and so forth, there is no other option for us. So when something gets cut out within our own political process, it hurts us here. And uh, I'm just really glad to hear that you acknowledge that and I'm sure so will do everything I have to do. Ah, no. I, I think what we ought to do is just go ahead and send a letter directly to the region. You know, and we have a region in Farmington for this area. I think we need to know. But I agree, we need somebody local. It's just very, very frustrating deal with people that don't, don't really care about the community and are just looking for that next step to make happen. So that's been my impression. But what I would like to ask, career technology stuff is a big deal. And I know that the school district's been working on that to get the programs going and I appreciate that. I want to know if you all are working together. I mean at the end of the day it has to be that I'm clear that now we're going to pour tons of money into the uh, SEOC and why you're paying Yes, yes. Are you, because one of the projects that's come out and I believe Mike, you've been involved with it, is the Industrial Workforce Program. I'm looking at a building that's out on Carmen Cole Road. I know the South West Indian Foundation has been looking at that building as a potential place for some of the training. And then we've got this ask uh, for building and availability for training and education. So is there a duplication there or what's, what's happening? Uh, we just have to put that building in front of look at it. This is called narrowing. But yeah, we're, we're currently in the process of looking for a location that's best to meet with the program we want to do. We want to have housed in that facility. Okay. We recently had conversations with UNM about their partnership with that, all the way they brought it to us. And maybe there's an opportunity to all work together on that. But right now, it's kind of looking like where, and can we be able to let the centers to help us push past the office to get it done by the way we are you taking that from that? We actually are in the process of a community school grant um, that is on our collaborative uh, community partner for that community school. We should be sure that we're doing a continuum of services within any facility for both high school students and those within the community that need us to do. Okay, so am I going to see the proposal? Is there going to be a task for this issue? Sure. Mm -hmm. If you believe we have the funding to do it, but we need to look location, my friend Rock Elementary, we're six years down the road and have built it yet because of the bureaucracy that we get to the whole field of the So that's really, that's why the cap rally is built up. We want to publicly take the job because of that bottleneck. And so that was going to be my ask to you all come as far as. Not necessarily this meeting, but around, 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 maybe outside of this meeting, is 
probably know that we have the bachelor's in nursing that is offered on our campus now. And that's been in effect since 2018, we had our first cohort. And that number just keeps going up. Um, we just had the largest number of nursing students in the bachelor's program to start in the history of, of the program. So that, that's a really good thing. And we're also working on getting the bachelor's in education back in Gallup. That's what I was thinking. We have a program, of course, you want to grow your own teachers. For these folks, can hire people, and they can find funding for them, but they can send them to you, and you can send them back to teachers in their schools. So that they don't have to go out to New Mexico or wherever they're going to the Philippines to bring in teachers. We have our own teachers start training here. But here's my question. The last president I talked to, the last chancellor, he told me that he was responsible for the Jimmy County only. Is that true? I wouldn't say that I'm... A Jimmy County only. Oh. I wouldn't say that. I think that we're really... I mean, we're really regional, and we have students from all over New Mexico that, that go to UNM Gallup. That's my, that's my problem, uh, because uh, we have Central Consolidated. We need to keep it there. And we've got a lot of people that are in the process, in the process of coming to you to get that degree that they can either go back there or you say it's still a problem to take it to either one or the other. But they're available. You need to start getting this program going. So we can use these teachers and we can have our own local force of teachers in our area. So that's what my, if, if you're saying to me, I'll sign on to their letter. So. De definitely. Um, I'm working very closely with Mike and Giovanna um, to provide this pathway for their current teachers to get their bachelor's degrees. So, we get together with whatever shirt the superintendent did, get together with you, 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I appreciate the, the plug. <laughs> and <laughs> One thing at a time. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. All right. Uh, legislator, thank you for this opportunity to, to present and, and talk about a a uh, few items that are of importance to us. I uh, just want to recognize our CFO, Blaze, and Bondi, and Director of Operations, uh, Chris Lane. We have a couple other team members here, uh, Rhonda Ray and Representative Johnson. I, I do want to recognize two board members uh, on our board here, Mike Hyatt and, and Bill Lee. Thank you for uh, supporting our, our facility. Um, the, the first two items aren't necessarily capital items, but are items that uh, do impact us greatly. Uh, the first one is medical liability insurance. Uh, there was a, uh, our current carrier, UMIA, uh, is exiting New Mexico markets and uh, I think over 20, 20 hospitals in the state were with them and, and they told us that New Mexico is the number one most undesirable state to provide coverage for medical liability and um, we've been looking at coverage and uh, it's expected our coverage is going to uh, go up by uh, 2.5 times. Um, we've been working with a few carriers. Um, we're looking at about a, a 2.7 million annual premium next year when our current premium now is a little over 1 million. So it's a 1.6 million annual premium increase. It's a big hit. Now, I know a lot of other hospitals uh, are, are struggling throughout the state with this. Um, and, and we're, we're fortunate that, that we think we can get coverage, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost us quite a bit. Um, and, and it's an issue all over the all over the state for sure. Um, let me ask you on this one point. Yes. Are you are you guys in, in the pool that the state superintendent runs for hospitals where they reduce your cost on insurance because the pool hospitals are there and, and they pick up from the liability system? No, I don't think we're saying that. Yeah, so for all of RMCHCS, uh, the entire health system, this is our, our premium cover. So if you do that, you have a cost savings to make The second one I do want to talk about is uh, labor and delivery. I know there are a few questions about this, that uh, um, our program, uh, when we did the analysis for, for this year, it was about 90% Medicaid is the number of births, um, percent of births that, that we do. And uh, the, the Medicaid reimbursement uh, just doesn't cover cover the cost. And when we looked at the analysis of it, um, we, we ran uh, an operating loss of about $10,000 per birth. Um, we, we could open open the unit today, but, but we would run a deficit of $2.4 million, which impacts the whole facility and what we can do. Um, the cost of, of locum's coverage uh, is, is expensive, but, uh, but we can do it, but it would take about $2.4 million. I know there are, are, there are funding mechanisms with uh, what's called HAP and, and, and TAP programs within the state Medicaid system. Um, uh, this issue is, it isn't just us as well. I know grants runs an operating loss. Uh, when I talk to the New Mexico Hospital Association president, there are other hospitals that are running big losses on their labor and delivery, and it's, it's the whole state, and people are struggling. Um, if there was something that uh, the legislature could do through the, the Medicaid program to help uh, rural hospitals uh, with with some of the cost of, of operating uh, a labor and delivery unit, that would be a, a big help. Um, and then the last item here is a, a project in collaboration with, with the county, um, uh, which they presented on. Uh, we, we had a, an energy audit uh, with a train uh, to look at our facility and, and the things that were needed. Um, it came in about $8.6 million. Uh, we have got started with our HVAC control project with the county for about $850,000. Um, uh, the rest of that up to the $10 million includes some parking lots. Uh, uh, upgrades as long as uh, some, some piping, some sewer piping and other things that are, that are needed. Um, but that's, that's a capital modeling project and, and that's, that's with 
uh, through the county and, and working with them. And that was shown on their, in their presentation. <coughs> I don't know how fans can operate a hustler in the performance mode that they can write. And this has no bearing on you guys, right? This is not a reflection on you because I've been here for 20 years and then you take on one CEO and get him out and another one moves in and we go and repeat and you can right? How can you make RMCH run just like Grant says? Because I'm telling you, if I, if I have something happen, I'm not going to your hospital. I'm going to Grant. Because I can get them all right the same day. I can get an appointment within one or two days, right? Um, the response is so much better. Uh, and, and how can you guys make challenges with like Grant? And how does that work? Mm-hmm. And, and I've been hearing my other part of question. Everybody in this room that's elected that has this one here that uses that hospital, we've got to fix this problem. It's, it's, I'm tired of hearing about it. I don't, it doesn't matter who the CEO is, it's the operational company. Grant's supposed to, to work at a little hospital and have doctors and everything there. But what are we going to say, okay, what does it take to make us look like Grant? If you need an MRI, it's not a two day appointment at RMC, it's a two day appointment. It's uh, not getting your family member going out for a broken arm or a broken jaw at $75,000 a point. And six months later, they're trying to file for bankruptcy and you're trying to get the reimbursement from the state Medicaid. I mean, I don't care if it's Native American, I don't care the population. I wonder if we as a community can get to sit down as leaders and say, not just the county problem, the city's going to have to partake. We as legislators are going to have to figure out how to do this. UNM is going to have to be in, in there. They can attract teachers. You're going to have a good hospital. You can't get any jobs if you don't have a good hospital. You can't. There's so many things that are tied to that. And each and every one of us don't know. We all struggle with it every single time. But I mean, you look at the amount of people that are leaving Gallo and the age that they're leaving for, and why they leave? Because they're no medical care. That's why a lot of our elders are leaving, because there's nothing here for them. I got to take my mother to the kitchen. Well, thank God for the flight now. Otherwise, it was a five hour drive because you never knew what was going to happen on the next I mean, this is a lesson that, that we're going to have to have a town hall, we're going to have to get a room. And we're going to have to get bloody in this fight, and we're going to have to say either one hospital or we don't. Because we can throw, I can throw $20 million in operational money, as you guys say, and you'd be through that in 30 days, catching up and, and not ever getting ahead. And until we rebuild that infrastructure and get you out of debt and get people behind you to do that, because I won't go there because. I can go to the next quicker than I can go to the last stage. I, I appreciate those comments. Uh, a couple, I don't know if you do or not. <laughs> no, I do. I do. You know, um, it's uh, one of the things with grants, and, and it all comes down to right dollars, right? So grants is uh, designated a critical access hospital, and, and they get reimbursed based on costs, right? And so for us, it's not that. It's you get reimbursed based on what's called a PPS system, perspective payment system. And so you get reimbursed a fixed dollar amount based on what the fee schedule is with payers, with insurance companies. And, and grants get it based on their costs. So if their costs go up, their reimbursement goes up, and they're able to cover costs quite a bit uh, through that mechanism. Um, we, we have looked at that. We have looked at uh, a critical access hospital, and we did an analysis on our, we call it a cost report, what we submit to CMS, uh, uh, the Medicaid, Medicare system. And uh, we, we would have been better financially, but it would cap our facility at 25 beds. And, and today, we're, we're at 25 today, and we could go more if we had more staffing. And so you, you would see more people being transferred out if, if we were capped at 25 beds. Um, and, and that's where a little bit of struggle is, because the hospital, in terms of the size, is, we're not quite, not quite big enough to really make a churn and uh, do well with you know, a census of, let's say, 40, uh, but we're too big to where 
you know, we're at that cap of, to, to make it a critical access hospital, and do we, do we decide, decide to do that? And if we do, then, then yeah, you're going to see some more transfers go out just from a bed capacity issue. Um, um, but to that point, it doesn't matter because if you're having a baby today, there's nobody in that room you show them to, to have it. So you're sending them to rent anyway. Uh, a kid that I know that broke his arm, right? there was no one here. There was no one here to set that kid's arm. Where did he go? On an airplane to Albuquerque. Right? So if you don't have something current, what is the difference if we limit our bed and, and, and at least have, you know, uh, an ability to stabilize the hospital over a 20-year period, right? And say we may not have everything covered, and you may have to go somewhere else. And we have 25 beds, and we're efficient, we're stable, and we're not running through the turmoil of, of no doctors here today, and 10 tomorrow, and 5 the next day, and the turmoil that. I mean, I just want stability. To try to, uh, and I, I just want stability, but you spend Kid breaks his arm on the playground, right? Where are they going? Out. I mean, we just want stability. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with that as well. I mean, I'm not, that's that's our goal, and that's what we want. Can you, can you go back to the birthing center? There you go, labor and delivery. So, in order for us to get that up and running again, you need two, about two and a half million dollars. It's good. No, I, I can see it. I know I can see it. But my question to you, though, is, is at some point, do any of these services become more of a profit center for you? Instead of just being sub, uh, like a Medicaid rate, rate, do you ever, are you able, able to build, I guess, additional services around something like this that could become a profit center? Yes, and, and the, the, the part with, so this is labor and delivery, right? So this is the obstetrics part of it. Yes. Um, the part that uh, over the last uh, uh, about year that, that we've been lacking is the uh, gynecological services of this. So um, <coughs> an OBGYN physician delivers babies, but they also do the surgeries within the OR that, that do run a higher profit margin that help offset those. And, and we have two wonderful uh, family medicine OB physicians on staff that uh, that are great physicians, but, but they really, really can't do the OR aspect of it. And so, uh, to help provide call coverage, and, and we have locums OB physicians come in, um, and to do that, that's what that's what this 2.4 million dollars is, is to do. But I'm thinking, is there some kind of a, like a multiplier to this? Are the services that would be triaged around something like this? The reason I'm asking you, uh, particularly when it comes to children's health, uh, after I guess a couple of days so they are able to go home, because we are going to have a whole bunch of new funding in what's called the early childhood fund. And we've been looking at trying to figure out how to extend those beneficiaries. We had said originally thought that was going to be about education, that it's not been the case. Uh, the way it's being proposed to be used because there's no real education component to it. So it's more of, of uh, I guess, child care, uh, visits, home, ser home services, that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering if we can't figure out a way to start looking at profit centers around things that you guys can do. Because I'd I like to do it with Candy Help the Sun so a bit off the ground. Uh, I'm not, I haven't been close to all the issues. I've, I've heard the complaining. I've received letters. I, I try not to take my nose into somebody else's operational business because I don't know how to run hospitals. And I'm not going to pretend that I do. But I, I know what we want kids back in. I was described earlier. So how, how can we do that? I mean, there's got to be some innovative ways to do this where we're not looking at some basic services that Medicaid won't cover. Medicaid is a poor uh, payer. It's very low. It's, then you probably come halfway close to what that would cost you to do these things. But I sure would think if we could get labor and delivery back into your hospital, that would really be doing confidence in the community, I think across the board. We 
we need to be able to sit down, possibly with some of your board members, and talk about how, what that looks like. Uh, and, and counting, obviously, but we, we need to do that before the session starts. I'm no expert in this stuff. I have no clue that I will work on it. I just need to be working in the right direction. If I throw me in coach, I'm ready. But I don't know anything about running hospital. Yes, well, I know we have a lot more on this subject, but I would like to keep it moving. And I know we'll need probably a dedicated time to talk about some of the things that might be more direct. Um, so <coughs> yeah, because it can't just be I need more money. Well, Every one of these requests has been about money. That's the one. But most of them have been. And I think we need to look at even a bigger picture. I appreciate it. appreciate it. You guys coming. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank uh, all of our legislators who uh, were primarily, um, for the most part, very business friendly last year during the 30-day session. Thank you for your support on a number of initiatives. I'm not going to take the time to go through each and every piece. We've given you an outline, which is uh, basically our broad 30,000-foot view on legislative advocacy and agendas for this coming session. It's still being massaged and worked out. But I did want to highlight a couple of things. First of all, um, the New Mexico True Advertising Campaign, which we believe strongly in and advocated for um, from the get-go, uh, we are still um, on board with that program. And uh, as far as money and dollars that we're uh, advocating for, we're asking that uh, um, the legislature consider the $20 million that the state tourism advertising budget is wanting you to use to attract um, a larger group of tourists to our state in markets that haven't been reached yet. And so we're asking for that. Um, to add to the existing co-op, um, we'd like to see the departments ask for $7 million. Um, this this co-op advertising goes to help events and advertising locally. Gallup itself is um, um, a benefactor of that. Almost $60,000 in co-op money has gone to uh, Gallup for the New Mexico True co-op program, and in fact, part of it's going to be used this weekend during the Red Rock Balloon Rally. They're going to be out here filming, so um, that's that's a good thing. Um, and so that's good money that goes back into our communities. And then there's um, $5 million that the Tourism Department is also looking for, which is tourism infrastructure, which would go to amenities and recreation, um, and would go to things like uh, possibly Red Rock State Park, that sort of thing, to help improve those things. So we're very much um, advocating for those. Um, and on the other side of tourism, um, Representative Johnson, I heard you mention it. We are very supportive of your uh, bill on the Intertribal Indian Ceremonial. Um, and I will tell you that speaking as a tourism commissioner, I'm also supportive but from that end as well um, to uh, see that legislation come forward that would provide um, a great board here locally and oversight through the county. We think it's a wonderful bill. Let us know what we can do to help you push that through. We are very supportive of that. Um, when it comes to energy, um, I, I know it's no surprise, but we are really um, on the bus that says we have to have all options and all, all uh, sources for our approach in New Mexico. We are an energy-rich state, but we cannot continue to beat um, the, the oil and gas industry and, and put onerous regulations on them that when they provide so much of our state's budget and uh, including a lot of the money that we are receiving um, in this legislative session. That being said, we also know that renewable energy is something that we've got to make a strong focus on. And so we are a believer in all those approaches. And we know that the hydrogen um, economy is something that we've got to get in on. Um, we were very strong supporters of uh, of uh, Representative Lindstrom, Madam Chair's legislation and the governor's legislation last year, I think that we had an incredible opportunity and it got fumbled at the very last uh, seconds of the legislative session. I'm hoping that these bills can get pushed through because it's still not too late to be a part of that $8 billion that's going to be spent over the next year to develop hydrogen hubs. Um, we, are, we could be on the ground floor of burgeoning a new industry and it could put lots of jobs back into McKinley County and benefits Siebel County as well, our neighbors. It really is a regional plan that makes a lot of sense. Um, when it comes to um, infrastructure, we are very 
strong supporters of the city's need when it comes to water lines and wastewater, those things that were mentioned today. Um, and certainly when it comes to the county's needs for roads and bridges, we see the, the real need there. Um, it, it, it's a critical safety issue and we are, we are, support, we are backers of that. Um, Senator Munoz, we are glad to hear you say you want to see some tax reform. I hope that's going to happen. Um, we are strong, strongly uh, asking that uh, we support, that you support eliminating or significantly reducing GRT pyramiding. I don't know if that's in the radar, but that's something that we've got to take a strong look at in our state. Um, and reducing GRT for professional services. We are one of the few states across the, the, the United States that continues to add taxes to professional services. We did a small step last year with accountants and CPAs. I think we have to go the rest of the distance when it comes to those professional services used by businesses such as HR and payroll and legal. Those, th those kinds of things make a big difference. So we're, we're asking for support there. Uh, we are also looking very strongly at the crime in our communities. Um, not just statewide, but certainly here in Gallup. And uh, we know that it's tough to recruit and retain police officers. Now, last year, legislature uh, awarded a lot of money to recruit um, new police officers. But what we're seeing, just talked with our, our, our new incoming sheriff yesterday, is that that pot of money is simply um, helping other agencies poach off of other agencies across the state. And so the Mexico Sheriff's Association uh, we are aligning with them and their effort to um, find ways to uh, put those who are retired back on duty without jeopardizing their retirement. So there's a lot to work through there, I know, but I think it's, it's something that we have to look at. Um, we're also working with the Mexico Chamber of Commerce. Rob Black and I had a long conversation yesterday about permitting processes across state agencies, and I think he also mentioned that he talked with you, Representative Lindstrom. This is something that needs to get done, because we have businesses often waiting over a year to get a permit to continue to operate or to open up business and expand in our state. This permit meeting process is, is something that has to be looked at, and we're, we're, we're talking about legislation that would um, put limits on things, whether it's uh, you know, 180 days to get a permit, and if you don't respond within that 180 days, the permit is granted. The other thing that I think we need to do is put some transparency in that, where um, permits that have been issued, you can get online and see how long it has taken for a permit to be issued. I think many times state agencies don't even realize how long it's taking them to get these permits issued. I mean, we're talking years in some cases. So. We're looking at that. There is a retail crime um, initiative called Organized Retail Crime, and it's the Organized Retail Crime Association. We're going to be coming to the legislature uh, with an ask for that. Um, this is a program that will create a large database. It's not reinventing the wheel. It's being done across the nation and other, other states. Um, folks who are running organized retail crime, um, it's happening in Gallup where folks go in, they have an organized leader, they rob the place, shoplift, and then go out, and then it's fenced out. Um, this is something that's uh, going, to, going to capitalize on technology, captures facial recognition, it identifies these people, it puts them into a database, and you're able to then go beyond just a standard shoplifting case to where now you're, you're, you're building a, a true case that could get up as high as a felony charge to put some of these people behind um, bars. So we're, we're looking at that as well. Um, with that, I think I've covered just about everything. We are concerned about paid medical leave, which we hear is coming up, um, and the cost that that would create for um, not only our business community, but every organization across the board. Um, we, are, we are hopeful that we can um, see resolution in that area that will um, satisfy both sides of that argument. But um, that's where we stand today. You have our list, um, and certainly we stand open and ready to uh, work with the legislature's um, requests from us. So with that, I'll stand open for any questions you might have. And, and I'm sorry for stepping in front of somebody else. I just have to take off for another commitment. 
Uh, first up, I'm Charlie Marcus. I'm the lobbyist now for the city of Gallup, and, and I'm very glad to do that. Um, and I'm proud to stand up for the needs uh, here in Gallup. I, I also, I'm a contract lobbyist, so I also have other contracts. One of them is CenturyLink. There was an issue here where you guys lost service uh, and there was no alternate uh, or diverse route to get out of here. Well, the only reasonable thing that, that we can see, because it's not reasonable to go through sacred winds, uh, only because of the way they'd offer the service, is for us to go through Navajo Nation with what they have is, is referred to as dark fiber. It's fiber that's not turned up. And so, but uh, the only way that, that they've, in the past, and know that I worked for that company for 31 years, uh, but in the past, they've never wanted to sell it as a wholesale it out, if you will. Uh, they wanted to sell it as a finished service. And so the only way we can do that is if we have a reasonable user fee uh, that we would pay with that. And then combine that with a grant, uh, what they call a middle mile grant, with the IT, IT broadband organization in the state. And then there's funding associated with that, which pays for 75% of it. Then that leaves CenturyLink on the hook for the other 25. But that provides a, a good, solid, alternate path. There's reasons why the sacred wind thing doesn't work, uh, and it's because it doesn't have enough capacity. And they also would not sell it other than as a finished service, meaning like a service anyone, any one of us would buy. And so it doesn't make sense. But what they're, what right now, what CenturyLink is asking for is help from legislators and help from local government to have a letter of encouragement, if you will, to NTUA. Uh, requesting that they consider going into negotiations with CenturyLink uh, for access to that dark fiber. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I, I, I'm going to make sure that everybody understands that. If you could put together a couple paragraphs, okay. and there needs to be a letter from the city, the county, all the legislators, and everybody in this room asking for that. Okay. Uh, and, and basically, it's a letter I still would go to the executive director of NTUA, uh, just asking him to talk to CenturyLink so they could possibly negotiate the use of that dark fiber. So we don't have any other options right now, guys, and I know that when we had the outage, the more recent one, we got more calls, more complaints, and, and needed, and truly, we tried to have a community meeting, George and I had a community meeting, we had a lot of people there that were talking about what happened to them and what the results were. And it's not just Gallup, it affects Grant, Milan, Laguna, everybody down the I-44. So we really need to do this. I think we just need to correct your lot of things. It's not a link, it's Lumen. Yeah, CenturyLink slash Lumen. Slash. <laughs> is it slash? Yeah, it is slash. Yeah, they'll, they'll transition to Lumen once people get used to the name. Okay, so Charlie has this work and on the ground, and once the letters are drafted and signed, uh, we'll send you, I guess, copies to you. But somebody needs to coordinate that, so I'm going to ask you to do that. Then. Yeah. Uh, we'll send it to you. Sure. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll get, I'll get with Evan on the uh, CC and who at the company is appropriate. Yeah. I want to thank Michael for doing all the work he does for us. I'm Bruce Armstrong with Greater Gallup Economic Development, Economic Development Manager there. And we have, a, we're developing a series of initiatives that we've been working on over the past several years around mobility, and by that we mean autonomous vehicle testing and development. That's driverless vehicles. So we we're going to be looking at uh, research and testing in that area. As, and that led us into the hydrogen. Did I leave it on that one? Yeah. So all of our initiatives are around mobility. And this is a mobility strategy uh, map for the area. And we're looking at developing assets 
and the Gallup Energy Logistics Park on top left where we have the rail spur, as well as a super center super for a truck stop off the off of the I-40 westernmost exit, right? and then developing the airport, the redevelopment of the municipal airport with a foreign trade zone, and also transportal at the Energy Logistics Park and also Carbon Core Road. And so we see two testing complexes up there, but it's really about we're going to be identifying the site for that uh, complex. And it's going to be a test course. And so our first priority we have I think for the Gallup Trade Court. This is an initiative of the GGEBC and the City of Gallup. The ask is for $1 million to continue the redesign and redevelopment of the airport. Currently work is being done by a consultant uh, regarding the upgrades that are needed. And then we've been working closely with the city on this and with the COG. And I think COG's managing that grant it was a $700,000 grant that did about 700 different things. Very, uh, and I've rarely seen a grant uh, that works so effectively. We've got a lot, a lot done with that. So the airport's going to get a new uh, makeover, new lobby. It's going to have a area for customs clearance because we're going to have a foreign trade zone. And so all of that's going to be there to complement the air service that we were able to bring back to Gallup. So the second priority, as I mentioned, the autonomous vehicle testing and um, testing and development complex. We've worked closely with a consultant. It's the Global Logistics Partner, and they developed the strategic the mobility strategy for the state of New Mexico, and also here for Gallup to be one of the autonomous vehicle hubs, the mobility hub here. As a result of their work, they recommended establishing testing facilities here, and we're looking to do that along um, Carbon Coal Road, uh, sites to be developed either in Energy Logistics Park or uh, possibly on a, a piece of land that the state owns at this point. So we want to identify properties that will benefit from the, cha the legislative changes that were made in the last session allowing for autonomous testing in New Mexico. And that ask is uh, 10 million, and had 100,000 of that um, funded to date. The next priority is in our effort to reduce emissions, hydrogen has emerged as a Option, a key option for renewable energy. And we're looking to help facilitate the transition from diesel to, to uh, clean energy. Diesel is the number one polluter. And more and more vehicles, and especially heavy vehicles, are uh, they're moving to hydrogen. And trains as well down the road will also be running on hydrogen. So this is, we're looking at uh, developing a fueling complex here in Gallup and also in Pruitt. And that's uh, connected to an initiative that we have to develop a hydrogen hub in Pruitt. So a number of you are at the the ribbon cutting for Carbon Coal Road yesterday, and as we pointed out, infrastructure is the backbone of economic development, and we need to get the infrastructure in there. So the, obviously, 
a huge priority, priority is getting great water and wastewater to the industrial parks that we're developing. So there's two, two parks along that road, the McKinley County Industrial Park, Anthony mentioned earlier, and then at the end of the Carbon Core Road is the Gallup Energy Logistics Park, and we need to get the utilities in there, especially water and wastewater. So $20 million ask there, and that's what we're, we are at with our, our mobility strategy. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I've got one question, okay? You get uh, a Monday under the economic development uh, and the race facts came up. And, uh, you know, the horse racing. And uh, everybody knows that there's a possibility or an availability of one more race track in the city of New Mexico. My question to be close was, how come we haven't looked at our area to go along with getting the county? How come we haven't looked at trying to bring in the first thing that we out here? If you look at that, you can see that it's down the road from here. If you get into that parking lot, count the number of out of state places that are in that casino. It's not all local people. Let me tell you that. Okay? The nice out of state sites like, are numerous. And that casino is not hard to get to. It's not easy to get to. I mean, it's not an easy, obviously, uh, exit. You have to go all the way around the one. That's the condition to get to it. So why haven't we started pushing for something like a horse track in our area, right off of Center State 40? And then, not only that, but our Native Americans are true horse people, true horse men and women. We would attract quite a bunch of Arizona money to New Mexico if we could just fit that in to this area. So that's what my thought is, and I'm going to leave that in your mind, okay? Because that's your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, horses, back to horses for um, mobility. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
the plaza. It's a beautiful plaza, but it, it, it's a little hot. You know, shade is, is nice. Having a little bit better stage um, would be uh, a good thing, you know, having some permanent uh, weather protection, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. And that's something we're, you know, we're in the beginning stages of. Um, so right now we're doing conceptual planning, which is available through New Mexico Main Street. Uh, and then as we get finished with that process, we would then go in for actual uh, construction drawings, that kind of thing, uh, help with that process. So uh, that's, that's all I've got. Let me ask you one question. Yes, sir. On the quiet zone? Uh, you know, I included that because that was in our list of uh, things, but I don't know a lot about that. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I, I assumed the city would talk about it, uh, and they did not. So, that's, so they, were quiet about the quiet. they were quiet about the quiet zone. Not, not to knock them. I mean, they have their, they have a huge amount of things to, to ask. One of the things Senator Kim that's working on that project was here yesterday, along with Burlington Northern South Bay. Um, and they went out and toured the site while they were there. Eight people went over the train. But when I went on the bus, the guy started dancing and gave everybody a show. But right now, uh, your, uh, your state uh, Department of Transportation Rail Bureau has funding for uh, not just the plan that they're working on now in coordination with the railroad, but also the design. And so we were going to put that to the presentation, but since the design is being funded, uh, we didn't think there was an ask for this year, uh, but we're looking at another million dollar project uh, in the future. But it sounds like EOT has been very supportive of helping Gallup get where it wants to go. We can't call it a quiet zone and really pedestrian safety improvements, but once you have those, then you have the ability to get those in your, through a process uh, as a quiet zone. So that's all, all I know. <laughs> I just happen to be an evangelist. Uh, yes, you, know, you know, Evan, that, that's correct. When we uh, had our diagnostic meeting yesterday, um, and previously before, when we had one back in, I believe it was in October, that's what we were informed that you have to have the pedestrian safety in place first, and that's the reason why we're working on the design first. And then, <clears throat> once you've done all of that, you submit all that paperwork to FRA um, with your notice of intent um, to designate it as a quiet zone. That's okay. I just have to go back. I was in the I got a picture of the guy on top of the train. I got a picture of the guy in the train. I'm Rose Easton. I'm the Executive Director of Gallup Arts, and it is my pleasure to be here today. Thanks, everybody, for staying late. Thanks to the legislators for coming and spending this time with us, and thanks to the COG for allowing us this opportunity and the county for hosting and that delicious lunch. Gallup Arts, for those of you who might not be familiar with our organization, is the nonprofit arts council serving Gallup in McKinley County. Our mission is to foster creativity, culture, commerce, and quality of life in Gallup and McKinley County through the arts. We do that by offering a dozen different projects and programs each year. We serve 20,000 community members on average annually. We have two downtown art galleries. We do youth art programs. We do concerts, art festivals. We provide direct services to artists. We partner on public art projects and creative placemaking projects. And I could go on, but today I am here to present two legislative initiatives that Galbarts wholeheartedly endorses and we've been advocating for and we are asking for our legislative delegation support on and our community support on. And then I'm also presenting a request for legislative funding for our organization. So first, Gallup Arts is really excited to be part of a statewide coalition of arts leaders and arts organizations who are working to establish a division of creative industries in the state's economic development department as an economic development and diversification strategy for our state and especially for our rural and remote communities. Um, the idea is to kind of do what's been done for outdoor recreation over the last couple of legislative sessions and create a division in economic development dedicated to promoting our state's creative sector. This initiative is being championed by uh, newly elected Representative Skipansky in the House and Senator Steinborn in the Senate. Uh, Representative Skipansky represents Santa Fe and Senator Steinborn represents Las Cruces. 
Um, the creative industries include everything from fine art, literary arts, decorative arts, what you'd think of, but they also include architecture and video game design, fashion design, culinary arts, metallurgy, um, landscaping, <laughs> lots of different things. Uh, currently, they employ over 9% of New Mexicans, and they contribute upwards of $5 billion annually to the state's economy, and even more if you include the ripple effects that arts and culture have in terms of promoting tourism, supporting restaurants and the hospitality industry, and increasing tax revenues. So they're already doing a lot for New Mexico. We believe they could do even more if they are viewed as an economic development strategy and if they are invested in as such. The vision for the Division of Creative Industries is that it would provide technical assistance, support services, and funding to fuel entrepreneurship, to help creative small businesses and nonprofits grow, to uh, create career pathways in the industry and workforce development programs, and to catalyze creative public infrastructure projects. Here in McKinley County, where 25% of our residents make at least part of their living through the arts, the Division of Creative Industries would be game-changing. Uh, this funding would definitely help us advance our community's largest cottage industry and take it to the next level and help us realize our full potential, and we have so much potential as a regional creative economy. We would be ready, I, our county would be so ready to pounce on this funding. Knock on wood, there's no wood, anyway, <laughs> if it should come to fruition. Um, just by way of examples, we have an artist in the county who just needs a little infrastructure support to create a home studio out of which he can offer workshops and classes for locals and visitors and create a whole new business in our community. I've talked to an audio engineer who wants to set up an apprenticeship program and could use some technical assistance in that regard. That would grow his business and train the next generation. We have um, a potter who, with a little seed money, could also expand his business statewide and start selling his wares in coffee shops throughout the state. So the proposal on the table currently is for a $67 million investment, $2 million to set up the division and administer it, and 65 to go right back out into the field through different funding priorities and mechanisms. Um, so yeah, again, our ask is for your support <laughs> in getting a division of creative industries going and EDD. The second legislative initiative, oops, oh my gosh, did I go all the way backwards? What did I do? I'm sorry. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, our second legislative initiative is, I'll just use that, that's easier, okay, as um, a $2 million increase to the budget of New Mexico Arts, and New Mexico Arts is the state arts agency. It, through funding for arts programs and services each year, it supports over 170 arts nonprofits and governmental entities statewide. It funds in nine out of ten counties. New Mexico Arts funding provides access to the arts for 1.3 million New Mexicans every year, and that includes underserved constituencies, active military and veterans, people with disabilities, and 150,000 children. Despite its long and proven track record as a highly impactful means of leveraging our state's robust arts and culture sector for the benefit of communities, New Mexico Arts has not seen a budget increase in nearly two decades. The average grant award currently is under $7,000. Um, and while arts organizations, trust me, they max out those dollars, there's only so far seven grand can go, especially as the field continues to meet expanded and exacerbated needs from the pandemic. Uh, a $2 million increase to New Mexico Arts budget would just funnel right back into local communities. It would support all of the arts nonprofits across the state working on the ground from small museums and theater companies to community concert associations, local arts councils like us, nonprofit art galleries, artist residency programs. It would help all of those organizations do more for their communities, uh, to hire and employ more artists, to engage more community members in the arts, which increases civic participation and strengthens social ties, to create new educational opportunities for kids and help improve child welfare in our state, to enrich and enliven communities and neighborhoods through art. Um, this chart shows the significant 200 to 300 or more percent return on investment that New Mexico Arts and its awardees already provide the state, uh, that return on investment would only increase if their budget was increased. But I, I do want to emphasize that the return on investment is in more than just dollars and cents, and New Mexico Arts funding improves the health of our communities economically, but also physically, socially, and educationally. And I'll just underscore that these two legislative initiatives are very complementary, but they are very different, and we believe both very needed. 
the Creative Industries Initiative would create a whole new support network for both public and private businesses in the sector in our state and activate our creative economy in new ways. And the New Mexico arts budget increase would really fortify the pillars of our state's arts and cultural sector, the arts nonprofits who are doing the hard work of, and the fun work, though, of um, contributing to and promoting our collective cultural heritage and identity. And then last but not least, uh, Gallup Arts is requesting $75,000 in junior bill funding from our delegation this session, and thank you, Representatives Lundstrom and Johnson and Senator Munoz, for already discussing this request with us. Um, $75,000 would enable Gallup Arts to execute three strategic initiatives in the coming year. Uh, first, we could continue to be a partner in downtown revitalization. We have a couple projects planned for 2023, including a really funky public art project in partnership with Main Street. Uh, we're also working in tandem with Main Street to think about how to activate Courthouse Plaza in new ways through our own programming. We've been incubating an artist-owned business, and we hope that will open downtown in the fall. And we're piloting, and we're well, starting in February, we'll be piloting a studio program out of Art123 where we can offer um, art classes and workshops to kids and adults on an ongoing basis. Our second strategic initiative is to expand our direct services to artists. We're developing relationships with two organizations in Albuquerque to provide trainings and professional development and hard and soft skills, so financial capacity building, how to start a website, and how to write an artist statement, apply for grants, um, build a portfolio. We would also like to keep our list zone at Art123 Gallery open. It provides free Wi-Fi and equipment to artists so they can engage in e-commerce and social media and digital marketing. And then our third and final strategic initiative for the upcoming year is to take the work we've been doing to build a virtual art museum, showcasing our community's incredible collection of New Deal art. Uh, to take that work and kind of bring it back home, so to speak, we've gotten funding through the National Endowment for the Humanities to research the collection, interpret it, and create online programming around it. And now we want to develop a public tour program, a group tour program, and a field trip program so that we can take full advantage of the collection as an educational and tourism asset. So. With that, I'll close and thank everybody again for your support of Gallup Arts, but also thank you all. We've heard all the amazing work everyone is doing to make Gallup a wonderful place to live today. So thank everybody in this room. <laughs> I did want to thank my staff, Scott Brendan, Angelina Perry, and Martina uh, for all their hard work and stuff. If you want to do it again, we'll put it together. Come to Grant tomorrow. We'll be doing another one over there. Uh, so we'll see you in the next one. And we'll uh, see you in the next one. We'll 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 see you in the next one. Uh, Commissioner Ward is on our board. Uh, he'll be interviewing as our past president, uh, chairman of the commission. So we do want to recognize uh, Commissioner Billy Moore for all the years of hard work and service uh, to McKinley County, to the region, uh, to the folks uh, in this room, and uh, just want to wish him well and whatever.
uh, I'd like to see, because I'm going to ask you when you come to the office anyway, what do you really want? You know, the three things that you want to hear, what do you really want the one priority here? And I, I think that's important. I'm glad that you gave us three in the old days to get 25. 25, you know, requests, everything under the sun. So uh, I'd be looking for that if you could try to um, try to get you know to the highest priority. Not everything comes out of the same pot of funding, but a lot of it does based on the things that you all presented today, especially when it comes to the infrastructure piece. It's the big pieces that we put actually into the General Appropriations Act, but then when it comes to other things, we're looking at working with the governor for state capital, uh, working together on, on our individual capital, working together on our individual junior junior publications. I think we're going to be doing more for junior. I know that uh, I think it was last year when I fought pretty hard to make sure that we would get junior. We got some kickbacks from the venue, but we're going to get more, I think, this year. We put we give everybody 200 million, or 200,000 this year. And, uh, Maybe I'm just going to get a little more. Yeah, they get a little more. That's why all the projects are solved. And also, <laughs> but, uh, we're going to do more. We're going to do more for junior this year. So that's good news. We've got some money to do it. We might as well get it done. So thank you, everybody. I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. 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 Thank we call it get together and everything. The one person I wish would have been here was Senator Pinto, because she represents three quarters of a gallon, and I represent a small quarter of a gallon. And so, and the means of gallon needs to be met. She's the senator that represents the majority of the portion of a gallon, and she needs to hear them. Um, I appreciate the lunch. Thank you guys very much. It was very good to go to That was a very good activity. Um, there's a wide variety of the two things I think people will be here with, and two things that everybody in this community needs to have is a hospital and a new pressure to get in. But those are two things that we really need uh, in this community. I don't know what it's going to take to fix our hospital, but we see them all better figured out because uh, when I retire, I'm not staying here if I can get services. It's just a fact of life, and, and it has to happen. You gotta quit throwing the blame on one shoulder to other shoulders to other shoulder. We gotta take some personal responsibility as leaders and elected the leaders and take the heat when it's good or take the heat when it's bad and take the good one to Canada. We have to resolve that issue for every single person that lives in the community. It's not just a few people, it's everybody. So we could do that. I, I think my brother would be happy and I did a good job today. Thank you. Thanks everybody that kind of concludes our program. Uh, I know that several of you are going to have sessions to figure out caps on how to get the paperwork done. Again, Brandon Howe is kind of our lead in Santa Fe to help any of the legislators to help any of you get the paperwork in on time, correct?